From the New York Institute for the Humanities podcast, I'm Robert Boynton. In this episode of The Vault, Francine Prose talks about Anne Frank, who was the subject of her 2009 book. On May 7, 2011, Prose took part in the Institute's symposium, Second Thoughts on the Memory Industry. I decided in 2005 that I wanted to write a book about the diary of Anne Frank because I had reread the diary, actually in the process of doing research for a novel about a teenage girl. And I was struck by the literary qualities of the book, by what a writer Anne Frank had been. And I thought that that of all the conversations that had surrounded the book, whether or not it was a Holocaust document, whether, you know, the horrible conversation about whether or not it was authentic, that very little had been said about it as a literary masterpiece, which it occurred to me it was. I mean, I began to look at the extraordinary novelistic techniques that Anne Frank had used, the way she created characters and dialogue and and alternated passages of description and narration and dramatization. And also, once I thought about it, it began to seem really extraordinary, something we all took for granted, which was that a book written by a 13-year-old girl had become this universal icon. I mean, now... It's such a fact of our lives that we hardly ever stop to think about it, but I thought I would think about it. So I wrote the book, which I originally intended as a kind of close reading of the diary, and then as a look at the publication history of the diary. That is how this book became so widely published and beloved and so forth. And I knew from the beginning that it was a very difficult journey to publication and depended on the equally difficult stories surrounding the Broadway play and so forth. So in the process of doing research for the book, I discovered what some of you probably know, which was that Anne Frank rewrote the entire diary during her last four months in hiding, that she decided after hearing a broadcast by the Dutch Minister of Culture in Exile, in which he called for ordinary Dutch citizens to save their journals and letters so that people after the war could read them, she decided that she wanted to be published, that she wanted other people to be able to read this, and went back to the beginning of the diary and rewrote it on 224 sheets of loose colored paper. And it's really, I mean, the Dutch Institute for War Documentation published in 1986, and it was translated into English in 1989, the almost unreadable so-called critical edition of the diary in which you can read her first draft, her revisions, and the version that her father made after the war by combining the first draft and the revisions. And and just parenthetically, I should say that Otto Frank did a marvelous job of editing. I mean, he's been accused of censoring and so forth and so on, but but it's an extraordinary thing he did. So I began to write the book, and has as has happened to me several times in my career, not as a novelist because no one really cares what you say in a novel, but but as an essayist and, and journalist, I had the illusion that I was saying something that should have been self-evident and that I was just making it evident and that everybody would thank me for making this thing evident that should have been self-evident. Well, I couldn't have been more wrong because what I discovered after the book came out and as I began to travel around talking about the book was really the intensity of people's territoriality about Anne Frank. I mean, their sense of possessiveness and beyond that, you know, which was fine with me. She was a girl, she was a martyr, and so forth and so on. But beyond that, their attachment to a kind of vision of Anne Frank that just didn't happen to be the truth. It was a vision that had been generated partly by the Broadway play and the film, and that is of this purely innocent little girl scribbling in the little cloth checkbook that gets found after the war and so forth. Well, part of that was true, at least at the beginning, but by the time that manuscript was found, she was anything but. She was a writer. She was a serious writer. And if you look at the two versions, which I did, and compare them and look at her revision process, it's really amazing what her achievement was. So again, I thought everyone was going to say, oh, hooray, we're uh, restoring to Anne Frank this gift that really was hers, and, and so forth and so on. And I couldn't have been more wrong. I mean, I, I'm not speaking about the critical reception, which was fine, but the popular reception. I would go out to talk about the book, and people were incredibly... I mean, I have to say that their um, reactions ranged for, often from resistant to actively hostile. And they would say... In fact, before, before this morning, I was, I was rummaging around in my desk looking for some of the actual hate mail I got, and I, I got in a letter quite recently from what was clearly an old woman in Florida saying, you're going to have to answer to G-D, 
PTSD, for the lies that you've told about Anne Frank, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I remembered, and finally when I couldn't find it, I, I remembered that I was so upset by it that I was just calling up all my friends and practically complete strangers and reading it to them over the phone saying, what do you think of this? And I thought I would read it to you. And then I realized that I'd finally decided it was bad luck and ripped it up into little pieces and thrown it down the incinerator. But I had it for quite a while. So there was a great deal of that. And also in the process of traveling for the Anne Frank book and talking to people, I became aware of several things which I'd just been innocent of. One was is what I would call the Anne Frank industry, which is really kind of extreme out there. The mementos and the, you know, her face practically on T-shirts. And also the sort of Holocaust commemoration industry, which in many cases, and and again, discoveries I made in in the process, was all the things that upset and scared me the most. Kitschy, sentimental, territorial, manipulative, all things which are dangerous. I mean, we all know, you know, I mean, in in my life as a teacher, I've stopped railing against the dangers of sentimentality because students think I'm telling them not to have an emotion, but actually you all know the dangers of sentimentality from the most sentimental movie ever made, or one of them, Triumph of the Will, to more recently the news coverage surrounding the death of Osama and the new 9-11 commemorations. I mean, the way in which all of that leads to or, or fosters and you know nationalism and exclusionism and, and so forth and so on. So I was suddenly immersed into that world, and I would see these kind of examples everywhere where I went of things ranging from kitsch to f- further bad taste. I mean, for example, I was, and um, I'm sorry if this is somebody's favorite spot in the United States, but I was taken on a tour of the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Detroit, which I don't know if any of you've been there, but it's 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 by the side of a superhighway in Detroit, and they have prison stripes and barbed wire are used as design elements in the facade of the building, and then the landscaping is what my husband called dead Polish grass. So it's all this kind of you know burnt looking landscape, and I was taken around the museum by, and again, what was so disturbing about this was that so much of it was so well-intentioned, really, and well-meaning by a woman who seemed to think that I had never heard of the Holocaust before. So she was telling me what it was. She was elderly. She couldn't have been more well-meaning. But I found myself, especially having spent three years working on this book, uh, in, and it was the Holocaust. So, so all the suffering and all the um, murder was all over the place. But the museum chose to go the sort of sentimental route. So there was the fake boxcar with the obligatory recording of the screams of the children and so forth. And as I was going through the museum, I found myself getting more and more sort of vertiginous and disturbed. And the woman said, and now we're going to go into a section of the museum we call the abyss. (laughs) And I said, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm just, I don't do abysses. I'm not going to do the abyss. (laughs) And fortunately, the architect was with us on this tour. And he said, well, actually, we have these staircases built in for, for wusses like you who can't handle the abyss, and you can kind of escape. So I, I went scrambling up the staircase. And so there was a lot of that. And I'll tell you one more story that was seemed to me sort of emblematic of, of the kinds of things that happened. I was on a panel at the 92nd Street Y because the BBC had, they were showing a new uh, film version on TV of the, of the Diary of Anne Frank, which was actually in many ways quite better than the previous, quite a lot better. And the panel consisted of the producer... And the young actress who played Anne Frank, a British actress, and Whoopi Goldberg, because Whoopi Goldberg was an expert on Anne Frank, it turned out, because in her early Broadway monologue, one of the characters that she did was a junkie who goes to Amsterdam and has his life turned around by a visit to the Anne Frank house. So Whoopi's now a go-to person about Anne Frank. So the conversation was going on, and much of what people were saying just was not true. I mean, my fellow panelists, it was just historically not true. And I, I heard myself sounding more and more pedantic and saying, well, actually, that didn't happen, didn't happen that way. Da, da, da. And I also realized that the crowd was Whoopi's crowd. They weren't here to hear me talk about history. They were here to hear Whoopi. And at some point, I just had just to shut up and, and let everybody talk because I couldn't take it anymore, really. And at the moment, I decided not to say anything else. I heard Whoopi say that the reason that Anne Frank was read and so popular and was popular even among, as she said, her nieces and nephews who might not be otherwise interested was that Anne, the Diary of Anne Frank was the story of a little white girl who made it. <laughs> 
and I thought, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the hideous death, I'm not lying about that, the hideous death in, in Bergen-Belsen and so forth was not my, would not be my definition of making it. But on the other hand, it, it is true that her name is a household word, that she's been published in every language and millions of copies. So I suppose in, in that sense, she did make it. But I have to say that at the end of the entire process, and, and one of the things that I was quite grateful for, was that it left me with as many questions as I thought I'd had answers. I mean, and questions about the whole thing. I mean, for example, questions about if kitsch leads to historical knowledge, is there a value in kitsch? If sentimentality does lead to an emotion about a historical event, is there a value in sentimentality? And finally, I began to think, and this is something to which I have no answer and can't imagine having an answer, about that very territoriality, about people's response to Anne Frank in particular and the Holocaust in general. And it's something that still continues now to this day, people's desire to feel a personal identification with the tragedies of history, even if it's not an authentic identification. And I was thinking the the other night, I was trying to remember a scene in Walker Percy's novel, The Movie Goer, in which the, he's watching, the main character is watching a honeymoon couple in New Orleans, and they're having sort of a terrible time, and they see some movie star, like, I can't remember, William Holden. Is it William Holden? William Holden, right. And suddenly their terrible, uncomfortable honeymoon becomes bearable and pleasant and real. Well, I think that something like that happens with people's response to history. I mean, the fact that they know someone who knows someone who knows someone who died in 9-11 or knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who was killed in the Holocaust not only makes them experience that event in a more immediate way, but gives their lives a kind of meaning and authenticity that it, it, it might not otherwise have had. And that response is very curious to me and very interesting to me. And it's not something that I can find myself condemning outright because it's, it's much too complicated, it seems, for that kind of simple response. This podcast was brought to you by the New York Institute for the Humanities at NYU and the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. This episode was produced by Micah Hazel. You can find us on Stitcher, iTunes, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more information, visit us at nyihumanities.org.